Good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning and welcome here to First Presbyterian Church. My name is Llewellyn Hartley and I'm the pastor here. And we welcome all of you, especially our visitors. If you are a visitor this morning and you have questions about the church, we would love to answer them for you. You can grab me at the end of the service or someone with a name badge on and we can point you to where um, you can find information or we can answer the questions that you have. But we do welcome you here today. I ask everyone to please sign the friendship pad that is on your pew and pass it to your neighbor. Well, friendship pad, the sign-in pad, the pew pad, whatever we call it here, I keep forgetting. It's still new enough and that's still back in the pews. But we're going to call it the friendship pad today. The little thing in the black folder, yes. Sign that and pass it to your neighbor. That's what I'm trying to get across. Uh, this is um, a wonderful season in the life of the church. We've got a... a a different kind of service this morning, but it is the season. And in your bulletin, you will find a, um, an insert that has some information about the one great hour of sharing offering, which we will take on Easter Sunday. Now, the one great hour of, sh which is next Sunday, by the way, um, the one great hour of sharing is one of our national denominational offerings. It goes to support our hunger program, the Presbyterian Hunger Program, the Self-Development of People Program, and the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance Program. Now, many of you have asked about ways in which we can donate money or are Presbyterians doing anything for Ukraine. This is how we help Ukraine, is through this offering. Presbyterian disaster assistance and then ultimately the hunger program will be ste are stepping in to serve uh, the refugees and uh, people who are seeking safety in the areas surrounding Ukraine. And the way we do this is if we have mission personnel who are in those areas, they help directly. We also have mission partners. So the Reformed churches, the Presbyterian churches in those countries that we partner with, we, they tell us what they need and we give them what we can. So this is one of the ways uh, through the Presbyterian Disaster uh, Program is one of the ways that we can help Ukraine. So remember that next Sunday. This is the one Sunday that really kind of helps those ministries that are those direct mission uh, ministries of the denomination. This is what funds them uh, most heavily. And so we need to remember that next Sunday as we prayerfully and thankfully give. Yes? There are envelopes in the pews for that. So if, when you are ready to uh, give, if you, just, if you write a check, please make a note that that's what it's for, or you can put them in that envelope to donate, and we'll make sure it gets to the right place. This is Palm Sunday. This is the last Sunday we have before Easter. This is a time whenever we begin a Holy Week. And part of our Holy Week uh, celebrations or worship services this week will happen on Thursday, which is Maundy Thursday. We will meet in the Fellowship Hall for a Mediterranean-style dinner. And then we will have communion and we will hear the words of Jesus that were um, from Scripture um, on that night at the Last Supper. If you would like to attend, please sign up in the narthex and we will make sure that we have enough food although we always seem to in the end anyway but it will be a time of reflection and we will sing together and we will hear the story this is a great day in the life of the church the moment we celebrate when jesus came to jerusalem when he rode a donkey and peacefully marking what was going to be the beginning of the end of his earthly ministry. And so I invite you to hear the story and read the story with me as we call one another to worship. I will read the light print if you read the bold. Blessed is the coming kingdom 
Hosanna in the highest. After he said this, he went on ahead, going to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethpage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they said, They set Jesus on it. Blessed is the coming kingdom. Hosanna in the highest. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Blessed is the coming kingdom. Hosanna in the highest. I invite you to stand with me as we sing together, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. You may be seated. So on this day, we do come to celebrate Christ. Christ as the king, Christ as the ultimate ruler. We anticipate the coming of the kingdom. It's a day of hope. It's a day of hope in a world that often seems hopeless and This year, Palm Sunday may seem a little weightier than in recent years. Um, There seems to be a heaviness once again. It just seems like we can't get out of that sense of bearing a burden sometimes. That sense that we are slogging through, whether it's social unrest, political unrest, a pandemic, and then war that is once again trying to tear the world apart. There are refugees, there are people around the world who don't feel safe from moment to moment. There's hardship, there's sadness, there's grief. 
And yet in the middle of all of that, we still gather together as the church and we proclaim the goodness of God and the peace that is coming. We lean into the hope that we have in Jesus, who didn't come into Jerusalem like some great conquering war hero, but rather as a humble servant riding on a donkey. So often we think of strength being on the one who can um, punch the hardest, who can shout the loudest, who can defeat you the quickest. But it seems that Jesus came to teach us that the real victory we have in God and as a human being is the power to withhold those sorts of reactions and instead walk the journey of peace and love and forgiveness and mercy. Things that often, especially in the headlines the past few weeks, seem to have been long forgotten. But this is the God we serve. This is the Savior who came. The Savior who said, turn the other cheek and pray for your enemies. And yet, he said these things knowing where he would end up. Suffering at the hands of religious leaders and government officials. But he did not lose his hope in God. He did not lose sight of the coming kingdom of God. Knowing that this was the way. That what he taught, what he believed, what he lived, what ultimately he would sacrifice and rise again to is the way for all of us to live into the kingdom of God. So even if we gather here with great questions on our hearts, can, wishing that we could change the world around us, in these moments Jesus tells us how we can do it. When the body of Christ joins together and doesn't just think of the hope that God offers, but lives it, lives the hope, lives the way Jesus taught us to live, we are part of the transformation of the world. We can transform those around us. We can give strength to one another. We can shore up one another when we need it most. And we can shout, even whenever we are in moments of darkness, we can shout along with those crowds, Hosanna in the highest. Praise God for this one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God for this one who comes teaching us the best way to live and be in this world. And praise God for the mercy he brings. So in these moments on Palm Sunday, I invite you to rest for a moment. Rest in the hope of Jesus who came saying, I am the way. Even when that way leads him to Jerusalem to die for all of us. Even when that means it is a hard and difficult way to walk. It is the way of love. It is the way of hope. It is the way God calls us to be. And for this, we say, Hosanna in the highest, and thanks be to God. Amen. As we gather in these moments, we come to a time of confession. We acknowledge that the reason for this season is that we need forgiveness and reconciliation between ourselves and our God. And so when we are together, we confess our sins together, not just as individuals, but as representatives of the whole human race, 
And so I invite you to confess our sins to God, whose steadfast love endures forever, so that we can live into the hope and the strength and the knowledge that our God loves us and wants the best for us. I invite you to stand with me as we confess our sins together. We confess that we have sinned and although we would like to deny it, we have forsaken you. We are horrified by the suffering we cause to you, ourselves, and the world you have created. Open the gates of your forgiveness and restore us in your love for the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And let's pause for a time of silent personal confession. And let all God's children say, Amen. I'd like to invite, oh, you may be seated. I'd like to invite the children to join me up front for a moment. Good morning. All right. Hi, hi. Well, okay, so today is a special day. And I have something, I have some visual aids here, if I can figure out. We're just going to have to rip into it. Oh. Okay. So, there is some fancy things over there on the communion table. Can you see what that plant is right here? Or do you know what that looks like? You know what this is right here? A palm. A palm, uh, a palm frond. It's like from the palm trees outside, and you can cut them, and, and um, we brought them in here to decorate. Because this is a special Sunday, this is Palm Sunday. I know I'm going to forget those. Um, uh, this is Palm Sunday. And the reason we call it Palm Sunday is that there was a time long ago when Jesus was going into a great big city called Jerusalem, and um, people were very excited to see him. And so... Have you ever seen, gone to, or, or seen on television, like people who dress up and go to football games, or they go to baseball games or something, and they'll have something that they wave, and like cheerleaders have pom-poms, and uh, sometimes people have like at Steeler games, they have the towels that they wave. It's just things to do when people are excited. They like to, or like you, you, people throw candy at parades and stuff like that. Well... Back when Jesus was alive, they would get palm fronds. They would take palm leaves like this, and they would get to them, and they would wave them like this, so it would be like they would cheer somebody on. So now, I'm going to hand you these, but there's a few rules, all right? They are not swords or lightsabers. We do not hit one another with the palm fronds. Because it's all fun and games till somebody gets their eyes poked out. Okay, wait, you got a couple there. I'll give you a couple. Okay, and so whenever they, um, whenever they were cheering for Jesus, they said Hosanna in the highest, and Hosanna um, kind of meant hooray for them. And so like they were cheering like, yay! And so they would say Hosanna and they would wave the palm from. So I'm going to do something we don't usually get to do. I'm going to, we're going to shout today in church. Are you ready? Do you think you can do it? You use your loud voices. I want you to say Hosanna and wave. Hosanna! Ooh, sorry. I didn't warn you about that. You should have seen that coming. All right. Okay, I'm going to do it again. 
Jose! Little, you are, I know you are louder than that. One more time. Ready? Hosanna! He's going, I'm too old for this. But, so, we're not going to be alone. I know some of you have these. We're handed out. <laughs> we got a woohoo. So, <laughs> it does. So, on one, two, three, we're going to say Hosanna and we're going to wave. Are you ready? One, two, three. Hosanna! See, they did it too. So, today... Just, well, you can take these home with you and you can put, you can take when I give, give you the bags. But today, when you see palm fronds, either these or maybe ones that are outside, maybe you can stop and think um, about how much God loves you and, and what Jesus taught us. And we're lucky because we live here in a place where there are palm trees everywhere. I've lived in places where there aren't any palm trees. And, um, and so we can look around almost every day and see something that can remind us of how much God loves us when we see the palm trees. So and you might even think to yourself, Hosanna. I know, it does. It kind of looks like a fishing rod. I know where your mind is. That's a good thing. So let's pray, all right? Dear God, thank you for this day and for um, the palm trees that are around us. And thank you that Jesus loves us so much. And um, we say thank you and hooray for all the things that you have done for us. Amen. Okay, here you go. I've got your bags ready. There's a bag. A bag. Take your fishing rod palm frond. There you go. You want one? Or you have one back there? Yeah. Awesome. The more the merrier. Oh, there they are. Oh. We do come to this time uh, now in our service when we consider the the um, love and the compassion that God has given to us. And we bring that in prayer to those, for those whom we love. So let's pause for a time of prayer, and then I will lead us in our prayers of intercession. Let's pray. We are grateful, O oh God, for all that you have given to us. We are grateful for the voices of children and those who are young at heart who can lift their um, praises to you. We are grateful that we are reminded each day and sometimes moment by moment through each day of your love and care for us, of your presence in our hearts and our minds and in this world. We bring to you the concerns that are on our hearts. In particular, we pray for those places around the world that are dealing with violence and war and upheaval. We pray for all of those who are fleeing and all of those who cannot. And we pray once again for your peace to come. And we pray for it to come quickly. We pray, O oh gracious God, that your peace will rule in our hearts and so that we can be examples to others of your grace and your mercy. We pray for those who are grieving, those who have lost loved ones, or those who are suffering of loss in their hearts. We pray for those who have been harmed by people who should have protected them. We pray for those whose, um, whose fear keeps them locked away. We pray, O oh gracious God, that we will be instruments of your grace to bring healing to those who are in need. Help us to reach out to those who need a helping hand, but also help us in our moments of pain to reach out to others so that we can receive your healing. We pray for the church, 
in all her many forms, those who have already worshiped and those who are preparing to, we pray that your name will be proclaimed and that we will draw strength from your Holy Spirit so that we can work together for all good and that we can build up the body and be examples of your grace. All these things we ask in the name of our Lord who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's continue in our worship together as we bring our tithes and offerings. And I invite you to remain seating as we see, seated as we sing our offertory hymn, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. And let's pray. Once again, O oh gracious God, we thank you for all the good gifts you have given to us. We thank you for those we acknowledge and those we don't even see. Bless the gifts that were given today so that we can use them to build up your church and to build up ministry all around us. In Christ we pray, amen. These are the moments whenever we shift we go from a, um, a focus on Palm Sunday and the celebration of Palm Sunday, and we enter into the week that leads to the Passion, that moment, those moments whenever Jesus is arrested, tried, and crucified. We, many of us, like to jump right from Palm Sunday to Easter without any acknowledgement that there was a Good Friday or a Maundy Thursday or anything in between. We don't like to focus on the suffering that had to happen as a result of our sin, but it's there. And it is very important that we acknowledge what we are capable of as human beings to turn so quickly from shouts of joy and hosannas to shouts of crucify and hate-filled mobs. 
So I invite you to hear a portion of the Passion from Luke's Gospel. I'll be reading parts of Luke 22 and Luke 23. While Jesus was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? When those around him, around who were, when those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police, and the elders who had come for him, have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. But Peter was following at a distance. When that they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him in the firelight, stared at him and said, This man also was with Jesus. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I don't know him. A little later, someone else on seeing him said, You are, the one, you are also one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then about an hour later, still another kept insisting, Surely this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. And at that moment, while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the, Lord, the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. Then, Masa then Peter asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they were insistent and said, He stirs up the people by teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee, where he began even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether this man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him off to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had been wanting to, meet, to, to see him for a long time, because he had heard about him and was hoping to see him perform some signs. He questioned him at some length, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him, even Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then he put on, on an elegant robe and sent him back to Pilate. That same day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other before they had been enemies. Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was perverting the people. And here I have examined him in your presence and have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither is Herod, for he sent him back to me. Indeed, indeed, he has done nothing to deserve death. I, therefore, will have him flogged and release him. Then they all shouted out together, Away with this fellow. Release Barabbas for us. This was a man who had been put in prison for insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him, crucify him. A third time he said to them, Why, what evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder, and he handed Jesus over as they wished. It was noon now. It was about noon now, and darkness had come over the whole land until three in the afternoon when Jesus was crucified. And while the sunlights failed and the curtain of the temple was to torn in two, 
Jesus cried out in a loud voice and said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. And when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's remarkable how quickly the tide can turn, how the cheering crowds can become a mob and religious leaders can become political players. Jesus' followers abandoned and betrayed him. Depending on which account you read from the Gospels, there are just a handful of women and possibly one disciple who remain with Jesus to the end. The rest are scared away. And this Sunday leaves us in a dark place and we don't see the Easter light again until next Sunday. And no matter how uncomfortable this story makes us with the violence and the ineptitude and the fear and the bribery and the power of the bullies and those who are in religiously and politically tied places, we need to rest here for a time, no matter our discomfort. If for no other reason than we need the gospel to make us uncomfortable from time to time. We need it to tweak our noses and to make us think about what life is like. As much as we may hate to admit it, we can find ourselves riddled throughout the story of Jesus' triumphal entry and his crucifixion. We're there in the crowd shouting our hosannas and shouting our love for Jesus and shouting to him like he's the new David, the one who's going to deliver us from all the evil and suffering in our lives and will make our nation powerful and stable and, prof and prosperous like any great king would do. We can find ourselves in the joy-filled crowds so full of hope and excitement at the possibilities lying ahead. And we can also find ourselves in the vengeful mob when our expectations go unmet. Our hearts and minds can turn when we don't receive that to which we think we are entitled. We get angry when we're asked to follow a difficult path to sacrifice what we hold most precious. How dare Jesus ask us to expand our worldview and our social circles? How dare Jesus ask us to make room at the table for our enemies, for those who persecute us? After all, we have never had to welcome those people in our presence before. Why should we have to do it now? We prefer the joy and the excitement, but not the sacrifice and the service. How quickly the mood can turn and we can become the mob in our hearts when we hear God is not only with us, but with many other people. We become the mob in our hearts when our own dislikes, prejudices, and values are challenged and stirred up by the powers who say it's all right to hate and to judge and to condemn. We like the joy and the power and the hope for the future, and we like our own comfortable existence, but we don't want anyone to ask us to sacrifice too much or to serve certain people or to admit we harbor those feelings in our hearts. Sadly, there are times when we may find ourselves in this story identifying with the disciples who abandoned Jesus in the moments when discipleship asks too much of us, when we have to set aside our own personal desires in order to follow Christ. When we become the ones at whom others point and say, aren't you different? Don't you follow Christ? Aren't you a Christian? And say it with accusation. We can become like Peter and walk away, afraid the crowd will come after us. When we are challenged to sacrifice and to change and to confess that we are indeed fallible, we can turn away from that mirror and run as fast as we can to avoid addressing our own shortcomings and to avoid confessing our own sins. Sometimes we may find ourselves with the women who stood watching Fateful through and through, fateful through so much, 
and always there, always taking care and providing for Jesus, but in these final moments, utterly helpless to do anything for him. We may feel their heartache at the injustice done to him and done to others who are wrongly accused, railroaded, and unable to defend themselves. We may feel their grief at the loss of a great leader or friend. We may feel just as helpless and hopeless as they have felt. We may find ourselves wanting to do something that will change the difficult circumstances for ourselves or others, and yet we are immobile because we don't know where to begin to change the system that has led to so much heartache. At some time in our lives, at some point, we have found or will find ourselves in different places in these scriptures. But that should not be a surprise because after all, this story of triumphal entry turning into the passion is our story. It is our story. It is the story of God's relationship with us and with all humanity throughout time. Time and again, we know God sets us on a path and there is joy and there is commitment. Then we venture off that path and God brings us back to our senses. God waits and we wait. We feel lost. We cry out and God eventually brings us back home forgives us, redeems us, and tries to teach us a better way of living. And there is joy and commitment, and then it starts all over again. The difference with the palms and the passion is that in Christ, God puts a stop to that vicious cycle. We see the ultimate way to live. We see the example he set and how his world responded to him. And we see how God loves us and how faithful God is to us, even though we are unfaithful. On Maundy Thursday, we will see our God in human form humbly serve his followers by washing their feet and encouraging them to love one another. And we have reflected on these things throughout this whole season of Lent. I invite you in these last few days of the season, this final week of Lent, this holy week, to take these few final moments to reflect on where we find ourselves in the story. Are there those areas of our lives in which we must truly repent and stop the vicious and destructive cycle that we are stuck in? Do we feel called to service? Do we need to study and pray more so we can truly know the heart of God? Where are we today as a church and as individuals? Where are we in this story? So I invite you to take this holy week and embrace both of these stories. The stories of the palms and the stories of the passion. And I invite you to embrace God's immeasurable love and grace that is running through both of them. Explore your hearts. Be honest with yourself and with God. And prepare your hearts for the days to come. Amen. Today, I invite you to stand with me as we sing our responsive hymn, the hymn that in response to the story we have heard, let's sing together when I survey the wondrous cross. Please stand.
Please be seated. He was going on a journey. 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 And Peter said. And Thomas said. And Andrew said. And Judas said. Where are you going? Who is this man? Which of us is greatest? Lord, is it me? He was going on a journey, and Jesus said. Come with me. He was going on a journey. 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 And a young man said. And a blind man said. And a lunatic said. And a leper said. What must I do? Take pity on me. What do you want with us? Lord, make me clean. He was going on a journey, and Jesus said. Do you want to get better? He was going on a journey. 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 And a woman in the crowd said. And a woman at his side said. And a woman at a well said. And a woman on the road said. Happy the womb that bore you. Yes, it was me who touched you. Can I have some of your water? Lord, have mercy on me. He was going on a journey, and Jesus said. I will be with you always. He was going on a journey. 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 And John's disciples said. And his home congregation said. And the Pharisees said. And the chief priests said. Are you the one who is to come? Could this be the carpenter's son? Why does he eat with outcasts? From where do you get your authority? He was going on a journey, and Jesus said. I have come that you might have life. He was going on a journey. 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 And the crowd were ready to say. And the crowd were ready to cry. And the crowd were ready to shout. And the crowd were ready to scream. Hosanna. Blessings. Barabbas. Crucify him. Hosanna. Crucify Barabbas. him. Hosanna. Barabbas. Crucify him. Blessings. Hosanna. Crucify him. Jesus was ahead of his disciples who, disciples who were filled with alarm. The people who followed behind him were afraid. So Jesus took the 12 aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, where the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and then hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him and kill him. But three days later, he will rise to life. Come. Let's go forward. We have entered Holy Week. May you take with you all the stories of Jesus. Reflect on those you need to remember. Reflect on all that he taught, all that he did. Reflect on the people he met along the way, those who loved him, those who judged him those who betrayed him, those who crucified him, those who grieved over him. Think about where you are in those stories. And may God bring us all to Good Friday, to Holy Saturday, and back to Easter again. But may the journey, however difficult it may be, 
be one of hope and love and mercy and grace. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.